Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can anybody tell me what today is? Palm Sunday. Sunday. <coughs> Which it is also springish. But I was looking more for Palm Sunday. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Luke chapter 19. And put your finger there. We're going to be there in a minute. Um, before we actually get to this, there's a couple of passages that I want to uh, read really quickly. Um, Romans chapter 5, Paul is writing and he says something that I think is very pertinent. Of course, what of scripture is not pertinent? Um, so I'm reading out of Romans chapter 5. I'm just going to read verse 6. Uh, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Another translation actually puts it, when the time was right. Now hold on to that thought, when the time was right. So I'm going to flip back to Luke chapter 9. <laughs> so Luke chapter 9, verse 51 Now, we're looking, in Romans, we're looking at the entire scheme of creation. At the entire plan of redemption that God had set into place from the foundation of the world. Okay? God knew that we were going to need redemption, and so he set in, plan, in motion a plan. And when Paul is writing in Romans, he says, when the time was right. Now, God knew when the time was right. But now, let's look personally at the life of Jesus. Jesus being God, knowing that the time is right. In verse 51, it says, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. We start the Passion Week today. And you have to think that nothing shows quite as much the, the unique person that Christ was, who being 100% God, knew that the time was right, and knew that the moment of salvation was at hand. But also being 100% man, knew what incredible cost was going to be exacted from him. And so on the one hand, he is setting his gaze toward the salvation and redemption of all mankind. But on the other, he knows that the cost of that is going to be the brutalization of his life. His ultimate death. And so he sets his gaze to Jerusalem. Another passage it says, I think another interpretation says he set his face like flint. Wouldn't be turned away. And he's going to Jerusalem. Now, I'm, I'm going to kind of back up. We're going to read uh, Luke 19. And last year, I kind of walked you guys through this. I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, the message from last year as well. Because I think it's important that we understand what was exactly going on here. Okay, all of my life growing up in church, Palm Sunday involved the kids from Sunday school or children's <coughs> church marching in through the church, waving palm branches back and forth, having no clue what they were doing, but being delighted to do it. Okay, and they're waving palm branches back and forth, and there's celebration and cheer and joy. Well, let's, let's look at Luke 19, Luke's account of the triumphal entry. Okay. So we're in chapter 19 of Luke, and we're picking up in verse 28. It says, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Now, 
one of those things that is interesting, when we were in Israel last October, you always hear people say they go up to Jerusalem, they go up to the temple. God put it in a place that it's on a hill. And there's no way to get to it except that you've got to come up to it. Okay? So even if you started off at a higher elevation, you got to go down before you can come back up into Jerusalem. And I think God did that as a reminder of his elevated status. Okay? You're coming from the base, the profane, the low, up to the holy, the set apart, and the high. So 29, when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this. The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? I think that was probably a little bit more dramatic. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think he just walked up and was like, Hey, what are you doing? I think he was probably, Hey! That's my colt! What are you doing? You can read into it how you will. <laughs> I know if it were my cult and somebody I didn't know were walking off with it, I would have questions. And they said, the Lord has need of it. To which I would immediately go, oh, right. Okay. But evidently they did. And as he rode along, I'm sorry, and they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the, and peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Uh, does that sound like another phrase that we've heard in the life of Jesus? Like the annunciation of his birth? And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And typically, in a Palm Sunday message, that's where you would stop. But that's not the whole story. Okay? Because we call this the triumphal entry. And yet the triumph wasn't Jesus' is going up to Jerusalem. It was Jesus going up on the cross. That's, that's where the victory came. That's where the triumph was. The proof of that was that the Father resurrected him from the grave. Okay? So we see this triumphal entry, and, and coming into the Mount of Olives, as you come up over the top of the Mount of Olives, you look right down onto the temple, on the Temple Mount. And it was a procedural thing that as you drew close, especially on the high days, on the festival days, you would begin to praise, and you would shout, and you would sing, and you would dance. And it was a joyful procession going up to Jerusalem. Now, there's a bunch of things here that we don't really understand, but in order to get a good picture, we're going to step a little bit further ahead in the, in the, in the Scripture to understand what's really going on. So we're picking up back in 41... And when he drew near, he being Jesus, and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now, typically on Palm Sunday, we stop at verse 40, because that next passage kind of bums us out. <clears throat> but 
But there's a few things that we need to understand. So we're going to talk about history for just a minute. See, there's, there's a political thing going on here that we really don't grasp. Okay? Zechariah chapter 4 tells us that when the Messiah comes, he will set foot on the Mount of Olives. He will approach Jerusalem from the east, from the Mount of Olives. And so on the high days, it was not unusual for those who were claiming to be Messiah to come from the Mount of Olives and to gather about them their followers who would proclaim that the Messiah is coming. Okay? And as they came down into Jerusalem, people would shout and they would cheer. Now, they were waving palm branches. Luke, the, the account in Luke doesn't share this, but the account in John does. They were waving palm branches. And they were throwing palm branches and their cloaks down on the, the ground in front of the Messiah that they were proclaiming. Why palm branches? Well, because they had them. But not only because of that, but because the palm branch was the unique symbol that the Hasmonean dynasty used as their emblem. Now, the Hasmonean dynasty, you go, okay, great, you just said something that really I don't know a lot about, okay? In the intertestamental period, the, the Jewish nation had been taken over by Alexander the Great. When Alexander died, his kingdom, his empire was divided into four parts. The first part of this, this period, uh, Israel was, was being held by the Ptolemies. Okay? That was one of his generals that had Egypt and up into Syria. That was the kingdom that he was given. But the um, Antiochus, who was another one of his generals, his family owned just north of that and to the east of that. And they, the, the, they, they contested over Israel because Israel is a significant crossing point from Asia or Egypt up into Asia. So there's the road that goes up there. It's called the King's Road. It's a significant portage uniting the continent of Africa and the continent of Asia. And then from there you would even go up into Europe. So it's a significant crossroads and whoever held it got the taxes off of everything that went either direction through there. So the uh, <clears throat> Period comes along, the Ptolemies lose power, Antiochus comes in, Antiochus IV, see there's a whole process, that the, the way the Greeks conquered was unique. First they came in with their military, okay? Now, the way Israel fell, they saw what Alexander did to Tyre, the expense and the might that he used to throw down that island kingdom, he built a land bridge between a quarter and half a mile long so his army could get across to the walls of Tyre. This is a man that is persistent and he's not going to give up. And when Alexander marched with his men down into Israel, the high priest met him at the gate of Jerusalem and threw the gate open and said, hey, take it, it's yours. We are not going to contest this with you. Now, what was unique about Greece, the way Alexander did things, is that he let them retain quite a bit of their autonomy. But the Greek culture began to insinuate itself into the Jewish culture. Okay, And right here we have a clash of what we consider traditional Western thinking, which is based on logic, and traditional Eastern thinking, which is based on other. And I, I can't give you a definitive other, except to say that Paul makes it clear when he says the Jews look for signs and the Greeks look for wisdom. Okay? That's kind of the difference between the two cultures, and they start to blend. All right? So, Antiochus IV, who called himself Epiphanes, um, he comes in, he takes over <coughs> Israel, he sets up the abomination which causes desolation, which is he sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple. 
All right? He was not satisfied with the process of Hellenization, the, the Jews becoming Greeks or Greek thinking. And so he decided he was going to kind of spur things along. And he went from town to town, village to village, and he required the priests and the people of each village to sacrifice a pig to Zeus. Well, he comes to a village, and the priest in that village, Matthias, is told, it's your turn to sacrifice. He says, I'm not going to do it. So another priest in the village steps forward to make the sacrifice, and Matthias kills him. And then Matthias and his children, he had five sons, they wipe out this whole entourage that's going from place to place requiring the sacrifice of pigs. Okay? And this starts what's called the Maccabean Revolt. Okay? And we get the name Maccabean because Matthias' son, Judas, was called Judas Maccabeus, hammer hand. Maccabeus means hammer hand. Okay? And their, their clan became known as the Maccabees. When they finally threw out and overwhelmed the, the Greek presence, interestingly enough, they kicked the Greeks out, but the Hellenization stayed. Okay? And, and from this, you can look back historically, from this Hellenization process, we actually see the birth of the two groups of leaders in Israel at the time of Jesus, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Okay? The Sadducees were the ones that kind of merged with the Hellenization thinking. Okay? And, and their teaching was drawn straight from the writings. They didn't believe in the oral traditions. They felt like those were of lesser value than the written word. And the Pharisees actually rose up in opposition to them and said, no, 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 no. First, there is no mixture between us and them. It's us and them. And second, all of the teachings hold true. Okay? So out of this we come, uh, this, this revolt takes place. Uh, it takes about seven years. And, and this is where we get um, <clears throat> Hanukkah. Because after they cleansed the temple, they needed to light the candle. They only had enough for one day, and it needed to last until they could purify more oil and bring it in. And, and it lasted how many days? Seven days. Okay, so this whole period is significant. It's not in Scripture because it's not God-inspired, but it's not like God was idle. God was very much at work in everything that was going on in the world to make sure that his plan would come to, to pass. Okay? So when the Maccabees finally took everything over, they established the Hasmonean dynasty, okay, of which the palm branch was their symbol. Okay? So when Jesus is coming in, it's significant first that he comes from the Mount of Olives because at the high days, they're looking to the Mount of Olives to see the Messiah come. Now many had come proclaiming to be the Messiah. They weren't. When Jesus came down, as they come down and they start to make their ascent up into Jerusalem, they start celebrating. They start dancing. They start singing. They start giving praise. Okay? And it's riotous. It's loud. When we were in Israel on the Sabbath, um, we were driving on the bus, and the cars would stop at the lights, and people would get out and dance. <laughs> And I'm thinking, you don't see that in Montana <laughs> much at all. And they would dance, and, and they'd go, and, and I mean, people from different cars, they just join together and start dancing. And, you know, we just sat and watched, and none of us got off our bus. And, and then when the light changed, they went back to their cars and went to the next light. So there's a, a, an exuberance that, that they exhibit, okay? And as Jesus is coming down, <laughs> into Jerusalem, he has both of those things on his mind. First, that salvation is at hand. Okay? God's plan is being played out right now to complete salvation. But second, he understands full well what it's going to cost him personally. Okay? So at one hand, he's got joy like we can't even really comprehend unless we're saved. And on the other hand, he's got agony. Okay? 
So as he comes down and everybody's celebrating, the tradition is they're proclaiming a king. Okay? And the problem with this is, Josephus in his book, uh, History and Antiquities, uh, he writes that whenever a high day, a festival day, especially Passover would come, the Roman soldiers, they would actually bring more soldiers in for crowd control. Because the Jews, who are a stiff-necked and stubborn people, okay, who want their freedom, when they see this person coming in, they celebrate, and their celebration soon goes from laying down palm branches and, and, and cloaks to chucking rocks at the Romans. Okay? And we, we know of one account that Josephus tells where 400 men were slaughtered during this event because they got so excited about the Messiah having come, they decided, this is it, we're on board, let's make it happen now. And the Romans said, yeah, not going to happen, and killed them. Okay? So as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, the mindset in Jerusalem is not, here's this person that's going to come and save us from our sins. Their mindset was very much in the carnal, in the moment. Here is a man who's going to save us from the Romans. Here is someone who can unite all of Israel, boot the Romans out just like the Maccabees did with the Greeks, and restore us to our rightful place as a sovereign nation. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, Jesus is coming in, the celebration is going. Now the Pharisees, we look at this, and uh, the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. <clears throat> now I think there were two things going on here. The first is what we have traditionally been taught in the church, is that they're telling him, hey, you are not who they say you are. So you need to tell them to stop. But the second is, I think the Pharisees were reacting in a very practical manner. They're trying to prevent a riot from breaking out during Passover and the Romans coming in and ruining the festival. Okay, So they're trying to keep things tempered down so that they can do the Passover feast and the celebration the way they're supposed to. But, but it serves two purposes. One, it's a reminder to Jesus that we do not accept what you are saying you are, what they say you are. And, and two, let's kind of keep our traditions and our, our celebration so that we can do that without the Romans coming in and killing everyone. All right? Now, so Palm Sunday, palm branches being waved. This is like, um, let's see, what could we compare it to in American history? Oh, I know. Let's compare it to a bunch of people dressing up like Indians and throwing tea into the Boston Harbor. <coughs> This is the same idea that's going on here. The people that are celebrating here are pushing for independence. They are longing for it. They are calling out for it. Okay? Just like in the late 1700s, the United States was pushing for its independence. They wanted to be autonomous. We wanted to be our own nation. Israel wanted the same thing. And they think Jesus is the man to rally behind to accomplish this. Okay? Now, look back in the life of Jesus. Can you think of another time when they wanted to make him king? Remember after the feeding of the 5,000? They talked amongst each other and they said, surely this man can be our king. What did Jesus do? He walked away. As a matter of fact, the, the reading actually kind of indicates he kind of snuck away. <clears throat> he refused to allow them to try and make him king. He is king. Nothing they say is going to change that. But it's according to the timing that God sets forth, not according to the timing man sets forth. All right, so um, the, the Pharisees, hey, rebuke your disciples. Hey, let's kind of tone this down. We got important stuff to do, and you're not it. But then Jesus says something. He says, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. 
Because see, all of creation is groaning. All of creation knows the dire straits that creation is in and knows the need for salvation that only Jesus can bring. The creation recognizes and acknowledges the creator. Unfortunately, the, the, the pinnacle of creation, what God has made in his own image, the only thing in all creation that God has made in his own image, man does not. Okay? So, we have this joyous celebration coming in, riotous, okay? People dancing, people singing, people shouting. And Jesus comes in, and you think he'd be sitting all up on that donkey like, oh yeah, I got this. That's not what happens, is it? Because, see, to Jesus, this was not a triumphal entry. Because Jesus, being God, knows that within a matter of about 30 to 40 years, he sees what's going to happen to this place. See, let's go down in verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Now, this weeping is in direct contrast to the weeping he did at Lazarus' tomb. That the two words are operating on very different realms. See, when he came before Lazarus' tomb, the weeping that he did was, was a quiet kind of to himself, a kind of, uh, you weren't really sure that he was actually crying. There may have been a tear coming down his eye, but it was self-contained, okay? But when he comes to Jerusalem and he's looking and he sees all these people celebrating and he looks and he sees this city that God has established for himself and he sees the temple that God has said would be his own place and then he sees knowing that within 40 years not a single stone would remain standing and that the Jews that were so dancing and joyous and the children that were running around would be slaughtered. And those that were left alive would be sold as slaves. That the Jewish people would cease to exist as a nation for almost 2,000 years. And the weeping that he's doing here is wailing. <clears throat> he is wailing. It's loud, gut-wrenching sobs. See, this doesn't look quite so triumphal now. He wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. See, he's... he's speaking in direct contrast to what they think is going to bring peace. They think by putting a king who's going to be a, another David or maybe another Maccabee who will raise up Israel and, and oust the invaders. But he's saying that's not the peace that you need. Because see, the peace that they need is what? between them and God. Because keep in mind right now, they have set themselves as enemies of God. Okay? They have the law. But what was the purpose of the law? To make us aware of sin. The law will save no one. It's incapable of saving anyone. The law was put into place so that we might know our need for a savior. Okay? So he says... Would that you had known that on this day, what would bring you peace? What brings you peace is my death. This is the cause. Okay? But now, they are hidden from your eyes. Well, that's pretty evident by what follows. Okay? For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now, I can speculate, but ultimately God knows. Okay? What would have happened 
if the Jews had received their Messiah as their Messiah in the time that he came first? What would have happened? It's almost impossible to trace that out because without his sacrifice, he would not be redeemed. And yet here he is telling them, if only you had known who comes to you today. <clears throat> if you had only known what brings you peace. And so he's, he's weeping and wailing over this place that he has chosen as his very own and this people that he has chosen as his very own who are going to reject him and then in their desperation to be done with him and be rid of him, they are going to violate the very law that he has given them to get rid of the one who gave them the law that they're trying so hard to protect. And he's wailing. <coughs> kind of changes the tone of the triumphal entry, doesn't it? Okay, now, Palm Sunday. We're starting the Passion Week this week. Okay. Now, I've been challenging you guys for the last couple weeks to lay aside those things which distract. Okay? I'm not giving up the challenge. Especially not now. Okay? Because this week, we commemorate, we set aside to remember the sacrifice that brought us our freedom. Okay? So I'm asking this week, Lay those things down. I want you to spend your time in the Word. Pay special attention to that last week of Jesus' life. Look at each of the Gospels. gives a little bit of a different glimpse into this week. Okay? John especially spends quite a bit of time in this week. Look at what Jesus is doing. Look at what's going on. Look at the things that he's processing. Look at the things the disciples are processing. Because this coming Friday, we're going to gather together. We're going to gather on Friday evening. And we're going to set a time aside to remember the cost of our freedom. Okay? The cost of our peace with God. The cost of the reconciliation whereby we can call him Father. And he can call us his children. Okay? We're going to set aside some time because, see, that's, that's the great climax it's not the beginning of the end, but it's definitely the end of the beginning. Because, see, now we are no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer bound by that which would eternally separate us from God. The price for our redemption, the price to purchase us out of slavery has been paid. We're free. Okay? Now... We've been spending a couple weeks talking about our identity in Christ. When you come to Christ, there are certain things that happen. The, the first is, the old you is gone. Okay? A new you comes into play. And this is a you that is going to be modeled and fashioned after Christ. Okay? It, John makes it clear. He, he says it very clearly. I must decrease that he might increase. Now this is something, John was speaking to a specific time and event because he had a, an incredible ministry going on. And he, I think he was speaking specifically, my ministry is drawing to a close because his ministry is starting. Mine is just a precursor to his. Mine is the voice calling in the wilderness, here he comes. Now that he's here, I'm decreasing so that he can increase. But that same concept holds true for us. We have to decrease. We have to get out of ourselves, that he might grow up within us, okay? So, in our identity, we're a new creation. All those things that you did before Christ are washed clean. The devil's going to come after you. He's going to say, hey, you remember when you did that? Remember that kind of person you were back then? Romans tells us, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When the devil comes and he tries to condemn you for what you did before, uh-uh, no. That's been paid. That, that has been taken away. I am no longer condemned. I stand an innocent man or an innocent woman before the Almighty God because my sins have been paid for. We are not condemned. Okay, so you are a new creation. You, have, you are no longer condemned. You're no longer a slave to sin. 
you don't have to sin anymore. Unfortunately, a lot of times we still do. Okay, That's what makes grace such a marvelous thing. Because where our sins abound, his grace abounds the more. Okay, So we, we measure our sin with an eyedropper. He measures his grace with a cup. And if any of us is foolish enough to measure our sin with an eyedropper, come talk to me after church. Okay, We measure our sin with a cup. He measures his grace with a pool. We measure our sin with a pool. He measures his grace with the sea. We measure our sin with the sea. He measures his grace with the infinity of the universe. Okay, His grace will always exceed our sin. Now, having said that, understand that that is not license for us to sin. That should be something that spurs us on to not sin. That we would become more like him. It's only through the power of his spirit that we can not sin. That's the cool thing. When you become a Christian, when you come to Christ, when you go to that cross and you come out on the other side, you're resurrected into new life. God's spirit is given to you. He dwells within you. That's what gives you the power when sin raises up in your face to say, no, I'm not going to. I choose to not sin. Okay? That's the spirit living inside of you. But there's one thing, one thing I want to touch on today that I think is important for us to remember in our identity with Christ. You know, he is God. We are not. He has always been God. He will always be God. We will never be God. Okay. We need to understand that. We are children of the king, but we will never become what he is. We are an entirely, the creation cannot become the creator. As hard as I make Legos try to live, I can't make them live. And even if I could motorize them and, and get them to move around, they couldn't be me. Okay? And that's such a shallow representation because the Almighty God is, is even further apart from us than we are from Legos. Okay? So, <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, I got one, one passage that I want to read and I want us to touch on this morning. John chapter 15, go ahead and turn there. Verse 12. Jesus is speaking. He says, This is my commandment. Okay, when, when you hear the phrase, This is my commandment coming from God, it's pretty important. Okay, this is a directive. This is Him telling us what He expects of us. Okay, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Don't, he's not even saying don't love each other like you love each other. Because keep in mind, it wasn't that long ago that the disciples are arguing over who's going to be the greatest. It wasn't that long ago that ten of the disciples raised up against two because they're like, hey, Jesus, put us at your right and left hand. Who the heck do you think you are, John? Hey, Pete, you grab his legs. I'll grab his arms. We'll take him out behind the barn. So he, he wants us to love as he has loved. Okay? <clears throat> now, the love that is being used here is agape. This is unconditional love. It's based on the giver choosing, not on the receiver's merit. Okay? It's not because I've done anything special to merit God's love. He loves me just because of who he is. Okay? We choose to love that way. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. <clears throat> now, verse 14. You are my friends 
if you do what I command you. What did he command? That we love one another. Verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for, servant, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. See, Jesus has every right to expect us to be his servants. He's God. He's the creator. He's the master. We're the servants. The Greek word used here for servant is a bond servant. Okay? It's, it's a little different shade from a slave. It, it's actually someone that chooses to serve. And the idea was that you were once a slave to this person, but your time of freedom or your redemption has come, but you chose to willingly stay in their service. Okay? And, and you may know from some other teachings that the symbol of this would you would place your ear up against the doorpost and they'd take an awl and punch it through your ear. That was the sign that you had chosen to, of your own volition, of your own free will, to stay as a servant of this master. Okay. So he has every right to expect we would be his servants. I mean, even with the price that he paid, we are his servants. But think about this for a minute. The God of all creation, the master of everything, by whose word everything came into being, by whose word everything holds together, he says, I have called you friends. There's an intimacy in a friendship that is not in a master-servant relationship. There's a, a familiarity. There's a comfortableness. Jesus has offered to us, to all of mankind, friendship with God. Now, keep in mind, James tells us that friendship with the world is enmity to God. So if you choose to be friends with the things of the world, by default, you choose to be God's enemy. But God is now extending to us the option of friendship, to be his friend. See, this is what is one of those identifiers of those who are in Christ. It's not just that we're different from the world, and it's not even just that we're more like Christ, but we're his friends. Do you ever think about the fact that, that God just wants to hang out with you? Do you ever think about the fact that God likes you? He likes who you are? And uh, trust me, He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows everything you've done, everything you're thinking, everything you're doing, everything you will ever do. And He still likes you. He chooses to be your friend. He wants you to be His friend. When we come to Christ, we shake off not only the slavery to sin, but we accept a new relationship with the Almighty God whereby we are called His friend. Now there's only one person that I'm aware of in all of Scripture who is called a friend of God. Pre-cross. At this moment, what has only been given in one place that I'm aware of is now offered to any that would follow. Okay? So... As an identity, part of your identity in, in Christ, not only are you a new creation, not only are you no longer a slave to sin, not only are you a child of God, you become his child, but you also become his friend. And that's a unique thing in the relationship between a parent and a child when they make that transition to being your friend. Somebody that you watch over and you take care of and you nurture, and, and you discipline, and then they get to that point where all of that stuff has kind of fallen away, and they become your friend. And when you talk to them, yeah, you still re retain some of this parent-child relationship, but for the most part, you're just friends. And this is what God has offered to us.
Father, we bless you this morning. And I thank you, Lord God, that this week, as we remember the passion, we remember your sacrifice, we remember your willingness to go in our place, to pay our price, to redeem us from slavery. You have chosen to call us your friend. Father, help us to understand what that means. Help us to understand what it means to love one another, even as you have loved us. Help us, Father, to no longer live under condemnation, but to live in the freedom that is found only in Christ. We thank you for that beautiful exchange whereby we surrender all of our ugliness, our pettiness, and we accept the beauty that you have given us. We've taken away our robes that are stained and soiled, and you've given us clothes of white raiment. You've attended to our wounds. You've brought healing. You've cleaned us through and through. You call us child, your child. And you call us friend. And there is nothing that we could ever do to earn this. You offer it simply because you are an amazing full of compassion, full of mercy, full of grace, full of love, longing to have your creation restored to you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name. <clears throat>